Hi everyone, so welcome to our second masterclass of the day um, for YA Thriller Con. We're joined by Stuart Gibbon, who is a former UK detective, um, and he's going to be giving a masterclass for YA Thriller Con on writing authentic police procedure. So if you're watching this live, then you will be able to use the live chat facility to ask questions. And we do have some time reserved at the end of a masterclass for a Q&A session with Stuart. So to ask a question, you'll need to make sure you're watching this in YouTube rather than just like embedded on the Eventbrite page. You will need to open in YouTube. And on the right hand side of the page, there will be the chat. So yeah, you can just put any questions in there and then we'll get to those at the end. So yeah, over to you, Stuart. Thanks very much. Um, hi, everyone. I, I can't see any of you, but hopefully you can all see and hear me. Um, welcome to Why ThrillerCon. It's going to be a masterclass um, from me about writing authentic police procedure. Um, hopefully I'll be able to give you some hints and tips on what to maybe put in your writing and maybe what to leave out. But of course, as a writer, um, it's entirely your personal decision how you go about doing that. Um, what I thought I'd do is I, I don't know exactly who's watching or listening. Um, so I'm going to just do a brief introduction about me and my background. We'll, we'll go through that. And then when we finish, we'll start looking at specific areas. I have left quite a chunk towards the end in the hope that there'll be lots of questions. So please, if you've got them, fire them away when we, when we get to that part of the talk. Um, if you haven't, as we're going through, if you think of something, just jot it down um, and then ask the questions towards the end, because this is your session i'm at your kind of mercy as it were so if you've got any questions hopefully i'll be able to answer them um, if i can't at the time then we'll sort something out and i'll get you the answers and i'll, I'll get them back to you um, so we'll do our very best um i'm based in the uk uh, in the east midlands and i used to be a police officer um I, I joined actually as a teenager i went to london to join the metropolitan police as a teenager uh, i spent nearly 20 years working there and then i transferred to another force in the East Midlands, in the centre of the UK, where I spent a further 12 years before I left the service. Um, so I did about just over 30 in total. Um, quite a large part of that police career was as a detective. Um, I worked at various ranks. And for the last few years of my police career, I was a detective in charge of murder cases. So I've got a kind of broad experience and knowledge of, of policing issues. Um, and even though I've not been in the service for a little while now, I still keep myself appraised of the changes and there have been a few since I left and of course in the years that I was there it's changed beyond recognition really. Um, so my name's Stuart Gibbon, um, went to London, moved to the East Midlands. Um, when I left the police service I had a short break because I needed to just kind of recharge a little bit um, and then I set up a business called GIB Consultancy which is based in the UK and what that is in essence is a, a service to help yourselves and people, the writers really, mainly um, fiction writers um, and often crime writers because of the job that I used to do. And what I do is I try and help out with police procedure to make sure that it's accurate and it's also authentic, because I think it does make a difference. If you're gonna put some, I always say to people, um, even if you're writing a police procedural book, you don't have to fill it full of police procedure. And in fact, if you do, it could be quite a dull read because some of the procedure is actually quite hard work for readers to get their heads around. Um, and understand but if you are going to put something in it needs to be right it needs to be accurate um, otherwise there's a there's a danger that the reader might lose interest particularly if they know about the subject already and they might just put the book down or not might not read another book by that author and of course as writers we all want people to to read our books um, so it's important that if you are going to put it in that, that you get it right and of course things are very different even in the UK Scotland is very different to, to England and there are parts of Ireland that differ too. So it's quite difficult to, to actually get things right. So you've got to be a little bit, little bit careful. Um, so I've been doing that for quite a few years now and how that works in essence is that um, writers will contact me either by phone or often by email and then we'll agree how we're gonna sort of progress things. Um, we'll either chat about it initially and then it's normally answering a series of questions or looking at a body of work, which is often the police procedural element and providing feedback about the accuracy just to give them people an idea of some of the things they may wish to look at. Um, so in 2015, I met a, a very interesting man called Stephen Wade, who's a crime historian. And we got on really well and we, we chatted after a, a crime event. Um, and 
thought it might be an idea to write uh, a book about true crime, really, in for the interest of true crime fans, because, of course, there's a huge audience, not just in the UK, but worldwide, um, but also to include in there quite a lot of historical and contemporary police procedure. So things like, you know, what happens when a person is arrested, what happens at the police station, um, how police investigate, say, a murder, that type of thing. Uh, and what that resulted in was the publication of um, our first book, which is called The Crime Writer's Case Book. There's lots of information in here about um, murder investigation, forensic science, forensic pathology, and there's lots of case studies as well. So that was our first book. So that's full of police procedure. You may already have the book. If you haven't and you're looking for something to sit on the shelf that you can dip in and out of, then that may be, may be worth a consideration. Um, about two years later, we wrote our second book, which is called Being a Detective. Um, as the name suggests, it's really specifically about the role of a UK detective. Um, everything from training to the type of offences that detectives investigate. And as the first book, it comes from a historical and a contemporary perspective. So there's things in there about Sherlock Holmes and things that happened in the 18th and 19th centuries. But there's also things in there kind of bang up to date, like information about cybercrime, telephone scams, different types of fraud and, and those sort of issues. So that's being a detective. Um, recently, we've been writing a series of shorter um, crime reference guides about specific subjects. Um, and that, that's what we're doing at the moment. So we, as long as the demand is there for, for writers and true crime fans to, to read the books and hopefully enjoy them and use them as reference material, which is what they're, what they're there for, really, then we will, we will continue to write them. Um, so that's enough about, about me and, and what I do now with the books. The books, of course, are available on Amazon or any, good, um, any kind of fairly well-known bookshop. You may need to order them, but you, you can actually get hold of them. Likewise, if you contact me, I'm sure that we could sort something out there in terms of getting hold of the books. So moving on to the talk, um, so it's a master class, so it's going to be a lot of my experience and knowledge and just some, some hints and tips, really. For those who are watching outside of the UK, there will be areas that I'm going to cover that will hopefully interest you and help you with your writing. But of course, because of my background and knowledge and experience, it's, a lot of it will be based around England and Wales and, and the rest of the UK in particular. So I, I hope that doesn't sort of um, put you off asking questions. Clearly, my knowledge of um, other countries is very limited in terms of their procedure. Um, but as I say, hopefully um, you'll have an opportunity to ask lots of questions towards the end of the talk. First thing I wanted to talk about was research, because I think with anything really, um, if we're looking into a subject and we want to know what we're talking about, then research is very important. You may do your own research, I'm sure you probably do. That may be through textbooks or other kind of books that, that cover that sort of information. So books is obviously a, a good way to start. But I was gonna just talk a little bit about the internet because it's available to, to most people. Most people have access to it. Um, and you can gather an awful lot of information pretty quickly, really, by searching the internet. And I just wanted to talk about um, how, how you go about doing that, but particularly a couple of cautionary pieces of information that may be pitfalls that I wouldn't want anybody to fall into, because I have known writers in the past um, that have had these sort of issues. So I thought it's probably best to sort of flag them up now. Um, so, for example, if you're looking for a piece of information on the internet, you do a search, you put that information in that you're looking for, um, you may get several results back. You probably will, hopefully. Um, and you just need to make sure that the information you get from the internet is actually up to date, because there, as I say, there's lots of information on there that you can access, and a lot of it is very good, very detailed, and it's also current, but you just need to be a little bit careful that the information is up to date. And if you can, try and corroborate it in some other way by some other means. You might not be able to do that all the time, but some of the information that you might find on the internet might just be a little bit outdated. So that is one of the kind of the downsides of using the internet for specific information around either criminal investigation or police procedure. The other area to consider is does the information relate to the area that you're writing about? So in other words, um, I've had chats with authors before who've 
um, when I've answered some questions, they've said, oh, actually, I found some information about that. And this was what I found out. And when we've looked into it a little bit deeper, we've established that actually the information they found was actually from another country. So although the procedures in the United States and the UK are pretty much very different, there are some kind of overlaps in some of the terminology and some of the words that are used and the phrases that are used. So just be very careful when you find your information that you're looking for, if you do find it on the internet, that it actually pertains to the, to the UK if you're writing about the UK, because you can kind of go wrong a little bit there by, by picking up the wrong information. But of course, the internet is very useful. Um, I would advise people, writers, to use it as much as you can. But with just that cautionary note in the background about trying to make sure that it's accurate and it's up to date and it relates to the area that you're actually writing about. Um, on the internet, there are lots and lots of websites. So if you wanted to find out about, say, the New York Police Department, they've got a website. Most organisations, the vast majority of police forces throughout the world really have got some kind of um, digital input in terms of websites. So you can actually just search them and look for them if you wanted to find some information, for example, about another country other than somewhere in the UK, you could go down that route. Um, in, this, in, in England and in Wales, and of course in Scotland as well, and Ireland, the police forces have their own kind of websites as well. So think about maybe dipping into those occasionally, not necessarily to find the information you're looking for, but just out of interest, if you have the time, just go in and search, for example, maybe, I don't know, Lancashire, just pick it out of the air, Lancashire Police, search Lancashire Police and see what their website looks like. There's lots of information around the departments, the roles, what sort of work they do. So it's always worth visiting the police websites as well. I've just got a couple to give you specific websites that you might want to have a look at yourself um, and see if there's anything in there that, that piques your interest. The first one is a CPS, um, which you may or may not know is the Crown Prosecution Service. And in England and Wales, they are the organization that prosecutes criminal offenses on behalf of the police and other law enforcement agencies. Um, so they work with the police, um, they're not police officers, but for example, if the police are dealing with a crime, they gather the evidence and they normally then pass that to the CPS for this decision on whether there's sufficient evidence to prosecute it. So the CPS have their own website. I think it's quite good. There's lots of information on there. There's case studies, there's prosecution guidance, there is information about the all the different types of offenses that exist. Um, so it might be worth visiting that website at some point, just having a look around, making a note of the address. It's somewhere that you can maybe visit in the future. The address is www.cps.gov.uk. So that's www.cps.gov.uk. Might be just worth you having a look at that at some point, or even if you just jot the address down for future reference. If you're dealing with crimes and criminal offences and you're writing about the police charging someone or seeking advice to charge them with a criminal offence, the CPS are going to be involved somewhere. So that, that website might be able to help you out. Another website which exists in England and Wales and also in Scotland separately is something called Ask the Police. Now, Ask the Police is exactly as it sounds. Um, it's, a, it's a website that you can go to and ask a question. Um, you might not get the exact answer you're looking for, but people who want to know about criminal offences uh, or anything like that may go there and visit and ask the police a question. And, and so that's worth visiting that site. And um, what there is as well as the ability to ask questions is there's lots of uh, topics in alphabetical order that you can have a look at and look at all the questions that have been asked about those topics. So there's absolutely lots of information on there. And um, that one's a bit of a mouthful, the website. I mean, if you just put ask the police in into a search engine it, it'll pop up or if you put ask the, the ask police scotland i would imagine it'll come up but i'll give the addresses anyway um, the english in wales ask the police is www dot ask the dot police dot uk so www dot ask the dot police dot uk and the scottish version is exactly the same at the start of course www dot ask the dot scottish.police.uk mouthful but ask the police is worth having a look at as well i've also got a website which is at um, www 
gibconsultancy.co.uk. Um, I don't have lots of information on that site about police procedure. Um, there's one or two blog posts on there, but what there is on there is a contact page where you can get in touch with me. So in the future, if you're doing some writing and you want to ask the odd question or you're looking, after, looking at more detailed advice, then please make contact with me uh, and we'll see what we can do to help you out. Hopefully that helps you a little bit. The, the last thing I want to say about research is social media. Um, the police are encouraged these days to use social media an awful lot. So as well as um, a website for each police force area, you're going to find Twitter pages, Facebook pages. Again, have a look at those because they're posting things on there on a daily basis. So not only will it be telling you about what's happening in that policing area, but it'll be telling you about the way that they police the area, you know, who's who's doing what role. Lots of finer details that you might want to include in your writing. So that's just a little bit about, about research and, and how important it can be. And just to bear in mind that it's worth doing. Um, and I think in actual fact, it's probably fair to say that if you put a little bit of specific police procedure, um, comments, roles, specific information, which is accurate in your book, then you can convince your reader that you know what you're talking about in terms of the procedure side of things. Um, so it doesn't have to be full at all, but some of the specific things that you put in there, um, if they're accurate and authentic, then it makes it makes a real difference, not just for you, but, but for the readers as well. So that's research. Um, I want to talk more generally about if you're writing police characters. So say you've got you're writing about a detective or a uniformed officer or someone that works with or for the police. Um, they're a lead character in your book. And often people do write about police officers as the lead characters trying to solve the crime and that type of thing. Or if they figure in the book, perhaps not as a lead character, but as a role and they appear every now and again. Um, so there is a tendency really, uh, and I can see exactly where this came from. If you think about when I joined the police back in the 1980s initially, um, and at that point there was a stereotypical detective um, which actually was, to a certain extent, true to life, um, of a white male, heterosexual, uh, heavy drinking, smoking, womanising, that, that type of character. Um, and those characters did actually exist um, for quite a few years in the organisation. So that's your stereotypical detective. Um, moving forward now to where we are you know, in 2021, the organisation of the police is so vastly different and unrecognisable in terms of its makeup. Um, it's a much more, thankfully, diverse organisation, which includes lots of women in lots of senior roles and ranks and positions, um, lots of people from minority ethnic communities. There's just a, a huge amount of diversity in the organisation, which can be improved and hopefully will be. But the point I make there is, if you're writing about a police officer, bring some diversity into it would be my view on it. Don't necessarily stick to the stereotypical unless it suits your purpose. If you're setting it in the 80s or maybe the early 90s, it may well suit your purpose or it may suit your purpose for your story. But if you're just writing generally, try and introduce some diversity in, into your police characters because it's there and it does exist. And it just helps to add to the um, to the authenticity of what, what you're actually writing. Another thing I'd like to talk about, which I see quite often, and it's around police characters, is about how the police talk to each other, how they engage with each other in person. Um, and to do this probably the best way, I'm going to sort of take on the role of a couple of police officers for this little bit of a role play. Um, so at points, I'm going to be a PC, a uniformed police constable. And at other points, I'm going to be a superintendent, which is actually quite high rank. Um, just to show you how things work, because I do see quite often um, that people think it's very uh, formal um, and that the senior officers tend to shout at the more junior officers and kind of order them, order them around and that type of thing. And that, I, I don't, I, in all my years of policing, I didn't certainly didn't do that and didn't witness it, I think, hardly at all, if at all. So it doesn't happen. So it's a much more, there is respect and discipline within the organisation, but it's much more informal the way they talk to each other. So the superintendent, He's going to say to me as PC Smith, they're not going to say to me, excuse me, Smith, can you come in my office, please? I need a word. 
that will never happen. They will never refer to me by my last name. They'll also probably never refer to me by my rank. So excuse me, Constable Smith, PC Smith, can you just come in here? I need a word in my office. Doesn't happen. The likelihood is it's probably if the, if the superintendent knows me, knows my first name even, then they're going to use my first name to address me. Um, if they don't, um, they might use nothing at all, but they're not going to use my last name and they're not going to be referred to me by rank. Turning it round a little bit, I as PC Smith, I'm addressing the superintendent. I'm not going to say, excuse me, Superintendent Jones, um, because I won't refer to a superintendent by their rank. It, it, again, it's just something that doesn't happen. Um, it will be sir or ma'am. Um, there are a couple of slangs that are used, slang terms that are used really often um, in the UK precinct. Um, one of those is boss. So boss is quite popular, particularly amongst detectives, but it also applies to some uniform as well. Uh, and the other one is governor or gov, which is short, of course, short for governor. So they're the kind of slang. They're, they tend to be when the officers know each other. They've worked together for a while. So if I'm a brand spanking new PC, please constable and I'm talking to a uniform superintendent. It's going to be Sir. Um, it's not going to be Superintendent Jones. Um, it's going to be probably Sir or Ma'am, that type of thing, rather than the slang term. So that just gives you a little bit of an idea. It certainly isn't quite as informal when it comes to direct speech as some people think that it, it may actually be. And also on, in terms of your characters, um, they're human beings um, and they will have their own challenges and issues. So try and give them a backstory, if they, especially if they're lead characters, give them some sort of backstory. Um, they're going to be working long hours. They're going to possibly have issues at home, whatever they may be. They may have child welfare issues, child maintenance, custody, those sort of things. The police as an organisation has probably got one of the highest divorce rates in, in the country, um, certainly in England. Um, so bear those things in mind. Give, give your characters a backstory and, and bring them into your writing as well. Have them with the challenges and the issues that everyday police officers do actually have. Um, things going on either at home or in their personal life or maybe even at work. Um, I just think it engages the reader a little bit more when they can actually not just relate to the character you're writing about, but actually what's going on in their lives as well. I think that just makes can make a big difference. Um, you don't have to go too deep into that, but if you do kind of mention things now and again, I think it just makes makes a really big difference, to be honest with you. So that's just a little bit about the characters, which hopefully gives you an idea that you know it is a little bit different to the way some people perceive it to be. Um, and it's important that you try and give your characters, get them really, really involved in the story, particularly if they're playing a, quite a prominent role. On the subject of realism, um, about writing how it actually is, particularly if you're setting it nowadays or you know not many years ago, really, it's important to consider how the police operate now because they are, in fairness, often really stretched in terms of, say, the resources. Um, there's not as many as we think. You know, we often think there's a. We used, we used to joke really in the police that let's can we open another box of police officers because we've run out. You know, and that was a kind of common, almost like a, an in-house joke about it. But actually, that, that box doesn't exist. It never has done really, and they are quite stretched um, resource-wise. So if you're writing about your resources and you've got you know all these officers charging around, just bear in mind that occasionally you might need to reference the fact that the, the individuals are short-staffed and they can't get something done necessarily because they haven't got the staff to do it. And, and that goes from anything from going to a situation where you might need help from another officer. That might be a long time coming. It might be a long way away. Um, the reality is that a lot of police officers these days, the uniform officers patrolling, often patrol on their own. Um, they're single crew, so they haven't got somebody with them. Um, so if they go to a call and they need help, they're going to have to call somebody else, and that might take a while. So bear those sort of things in mind. Um, time scales, again, it takes, th it takes time for things to go into place. So I mentioned a little bit earlier about the CPS and the role that they play. Um, if you were to send a file, an evidential file off to the CPS for some advice, um, unless it's a particularly urgent case, then it's gonna take several weeks for that, that file to come back with the advice. 
and even then there may be extra work that's required. So bear those sort of time scale issues in mind. Another example of that is forensic uh, evidence. So if you've been dealing with a crime and you need to send forensic evidence away to a laboratory, often again, unless it's fast track, which means it's very expensive and it can be turned around pretty quickly, and unless that applies, the vast majority of cases take several weeks for um, the results to come back, whether that be um, blood, DNA, fingerprints, slightly different. But forensic evidence in general can take quite a while to come back. So bear those time scales in mind when you're, when you're writing things in, in your book. Um, and also the other commitments that the officers and staff have, because they will have other commitments. Um, I mentioned the uniform officers on, on shift when they're going out on patrol, they might be on their own, single crewed. Um, on their workload, the crimes that they have to investigate, uh, your average PC, their workload will be in double figures, um, comfortably I would suggest with um, most most officers. So that's all the crimes they have to investigate. So it won't just have, there won't just be that one case, there'll be a number of cases. And the same applies to detectives working in a, a CID office. They will have a number of crimes to investigate at once, not just the one. Of course, if a murder happens, um, they may be prioritised to deal with that murder, of course, but they'll still have their workload to manage somehow in the background as well. And of course, in, uh, officers in charge, uh, detectives in charge of murder cases very rarely have one murder to investigate at one time. They'll often have several. They won't all have just happened, hopefully. Um, they'll be in different stages. So you may have one that's happened in the last couple of weeks, another one that happened maybe a month or two ago, and possibly two or three maybe that are waiting to go to court. But they're all commitments. So bear that in mind as well. Just the challenges around kind of modern day policing when it comes to what the officers are, have, have to deal with. Uh, and some of those areas you can probably feed in feed into your writing as well. Uh, it's worthwhile. If you're writing about um, a modern day police officer, they, they look a little bit different and they're carrying kind of slightly different gear to what they did several years ago. Um, when I joined in, in the 80s into the 90s, we had a, a personal radio, a an old fashioned truncheon, um, some handcuffs. Um, and eventually we, we obtained a little CS spray, uh, incapacitant spray. Moving forward to now, um, officers have all sorts of uh, equipment that they've got with them. Um, they've got electronic devices, electronic mobile devices that they have, They're a little bit like Blackberries. Um, so previously, if I would have gone to see a victim and I wanted to take a, a witness statement from them, they would be down to pen and paper and write it out and get it signed. Whereas nowadays, quite often, these little BlackBerry mobile devices are capable of recording a witness statement um, and, and digitally getting the victim to digitally sign it. And the officers generally wear them on their body armor somewhere. Um, and they can give access to all the databases, a lot of the databases that you used to have to take all details in pen and paper, go back to the station and write it all up, type it all up on a computer. Nowadays, a lot of it can go straight through onto the databases. So, those sort of areas have moved on leaps and bounds from years gone by. Um, body cameras, known as body cams. A lot of officers these days will be wearing their body cam. It's not recording all the time. They'll switch it on when they need to. So if they go to an incident where they think they may need to record evidence, they'll switch the body cam on and it will run until they switch it off. When they go back to the station, they need to download the footage. So that's something that's fairly recent, really, last few years. Tasers. Quite a lot of frontline officers now are equipped with tasers, the electronic kind of stun gun, which is often yellow in colour, looks like a gun, uh, and is often kind of carried again near the, near the waist around the sort of body armour area. So from a technology point of view, things have changed a great deal, and it's worth knowing those sort of areas because, you, again, you can feed them in to your writing. Um, there are even little mobile fingerprint devices now that officers sometimes have access to so if I was stopped in the street by a police officer uh, who was unsure about my identity and thought I might be wanted for a crime, rather than making a decision on how they were going to progress it, possibly deciding to arrest me or not arrest me, um, they can check on a mobile fingerprint device now, which is just by inserting one or another digit, two in total, but one after the other normally, um, and searching against the database. It goes straight through to the database. 
that's something that was never available again in years gone by. So things have moved on a long way in terms of what's available to police officers um, to be able to help them to do their job more effectively. Um, and I think that's probably worth bearing in mind. As we move on, we're gonna I'm gonna talk about TV um, for two reasons, um, and then about one or two of the what I would say are probably misconceptions um, where people have seen things on television and maybe thought that that's the way it, it happens in reality. Um, but first, I'd say that when we talked very, at the very start about research, a good way of researching, which I didn't mention then, but actually is very useful, is watching things on the television. Um, there are lots of truth. I mean, there's lots of channels now, of course, on TV that you can watch true crime documentaries. There's quite a lot on, on mainstream television as well. Um, there are programs. There's one particular called 24 Hours in Police Custody, which is often on, I think it's on Channel 4, which is worth watching because it's a behind, it's kind of fly on the wall, behind the scenes look at, I think it's Bedfordshire and Hertfordshire normally, constabulary, while they're doing their job. So you get to look inside the interview room, you see the custody area where people are being booked in or charged uh, or processed. Uh, and you see the officers out dealing with and you see the forensic side so that's a good one uh, another one that's been back on recently is called forensics the real csi i think that's been on bbc2 um, again that's looking at true to life cases uh, in the uk often murder cases and it takes you right from the reporting of the crime all the way through to what happens at the end and they will give you lots of really useful information about the titles of different roles the items and equipment that police use and the tactics and methods that they adopt very very worthwhile watching so tv can be um, a really useful source for your research and i would advise that you do you know have a look at some of these true crime programs um there is a phrase that's often used and i think they actually use it on tv it's been used before which is that the police have 24 hours in which to um have hold someone in police custody before they have to either release them or charge them um, and it's a common held belief that, that that is the case. Um, it's not strictly true. Um, whilst it's fair to say the majority of cases are dealt with within 24 hours and the person is either charged or released within that time. Um, the police, particularly in England and Wales, have the ability to hold someone for longer. In actual fact, the maximum time that someone can be held in custody in England and Wales is, is 96 hours. Um, it's very rare that, that that will happen, but, but lawfully, providing it's justified and authorised, that can happen. Now, of that period of 96 hours, the first 36 hours um, would be decided by a senior officer in the police area where this was happening. Um, but after 36 hours and up to 96 hours, that decision making quite rightly rests with magistrates at a magistrate's court. So the police would have to go the detained take the detained person with them and their solicitor if they have one and there would be then um, comments made by both um, the police and the person in custody and the, the magistrates would then have to decide whether it's justifiable to keep the person in custody and um, they can do it for short sections they don't have to do it for the for the whole period but actually 96 hours is um, is the maximum period scotland is of course different um, it's normally 12 hours, depending on the circumstances, but they can get authority up to 24 hours. But just bear in mind, certainly for England and Wales, if you think it's, it is 24 hours and then everything stops, that's, that's not always the case. Particularly in murder and serious cases, it's very much the case that people will be detained for longer than 24 hours. Um, I mentioned earlier on about the crime reference guides that we've started writing. This particular one is called um, comprehensive guide to arrest and detention and there's everything in there as the title suggests about what happens when somebody's arrested um, to the point they get to the police station and then what happens from then on so all the process around being given your rights what you're entitled to what the police can and can't do in terms of sampling that type of thing and then what may happen at the end of that detention so that's a, a reference guide that will give you most of hopefully what you would need to know about um, that UK arrest and detention. So we've dealt with 24 hours in police custody. There were a couple of um, specific roles that I wanted to talk about, where again, it's sort of 
there is sometimes a little bit of confusion about what the roles are and what they look like and i can completely understand why that's the case um the first one is the coroner um again we're talking really mainly about england and wales it's a slightly different system in place in scotland but as far as the coroner the role of the coroner goes um there is a thought process that they're, they're heavily involved in the police investigation to say a murder um and that they involved in maybe carrying out or, or being part of the post-mortem examination process uh taking statements from people working alongside the police as they investigate that death that isn't the case the coroner is a very important person in the whole process in fact they're probably the most important person in any death um, but they oversee the process so they will want to be kept informed by the police about what is happening and about the fact that a, a death has occurred and it's being treated as suspicious perhaps a murder they'll want to be kept up to date as to what happens during the course of that investigation um, but they won't get involved from a hands-on perspective in fact there are two things that a coroner does do in terms of authority which is really important to bear in mind the coroner um, has to authorize uh, what's known as a forensic post-mortem which is a, a specific post-mortem in a murder or suspicious death case um, has to be authorized by the coroner but they're not involved in, in the actual post-mortem in any way shape or form and if a body is moved from one area to another or moved from a crime scene to a hospital mortuary or elsewhere the coroner has to authorize the removal of that body so they do sit above the process but they oversee it all um, but they're not hands-on um, and they want to know what's happening but they won't be completely involved in terms of being there and being present um, if there's any police um, if anybody's charged as a result of a death and it goes to a court criminal court the inquest which is basically a finding shared by the coroner as to how the death occurred that will all hold off until the criminal side has been completed and only when that's been completed whether it be a trial or anything else will the inquest take place so it could be a considerable time um, after the death uh, in suspicious cases in particular where the inquest will take place so that's the coroner the other person i want to mention was the sio the senior investigating officer um, an sio is basically someone that's in charge of a serious case generally um, it will often be a murder but it could be another serious crime um, in most cases it's a, it's a detective chief inspector a dci or it might be a di if it's really really uh, complex it could be a slightly higher rank but often it's a dci or a di um, and when you see your tv crime dramas about uh, murder and crime you'll often see the sio um, and they'll be charging around doing all sorts of things uh, arresting people interviewing witnesses and then back at the station they'll be interviewing suspects and they'll be present at the crime scene as well um, that isn't how it actually works in reality although um, as an sio and when i was previously i would always want to go and, and look at the crime scene um, they're going to be protected from head to foot or really should be um, with forensic gloves and uh, overshoes and face mask and everything because you don't want to leave evidence in that crime scene so when you see on TV, maybe sometimes the SIO or another police officer um, or somebody else stepping into that crime scene where the body is or where the body was um, without any protective clothing, then that really is a big no-no. And that's one that will often have me jumping off my seat when I'm, when I'm watching one of these programs because that's not how it happens or should happen in reality. And in terms of doing lots of things as well, the SIO is, as you can imagine, extremely busy have to make lots and lots of big decisions um but they don't interview suspects um they don't interview witnesses a, a lot of what happens in a murder is, is delegated by the cs uh, by the sio to other people within the investigation team they won't do it themselves um so again i can completely understand why tv portrays it in that way because they normally have an hour or two to fit everything in and, and there has to be an, a, an element of artistic license to make sure that people enjoy it and it's exciting and it comes to a you know a conclusion of some sort in the time scales that they have to write it but in reality the sio um, a lot of what they'll do will be office based and um, they will of course go out from time to time 
and they will be involved sometimes with the media um, but a lot of what they'll do is is based around coordinating so i liken it to the conductor in an orchestra the sio is the conductor and they're making sure that everything they're juggling these balls and they're making sure that everything's going hopefully according to plan the book stops with them of course if anything goes wrong they hold the ultimate responsibility um, one of the things they do need to do which i don't see referred to very often in books and again you don't need to put too much in about it but i think it just adds a bit of realism to the writing is that sios have to write their own policy um, around what they're doing in a murder case and it's not every single decision but it's every key and critical decision so if it's a decision to arrest somebody for example to search a particular area to um, have some forensic examination to do to house to house inquiries all of those sort of critical areas need to be documented by the sio um, and it's something that takes quite a bit of time they don't necessarily do it there and then they may write it immediately in a rough book but then they have to find the time somewhere along the line to sit down somewhere quiet and write it up so there'd be nothing better if you're writing about an sio or a murder case to just reference the fact that the sio is responsible for writing their own policy now um they may do it in a book similar to this this is a policy file a police policy file um as you can see it's quite thick but in a murder case an sio would probably get through maybe eight to ten maybe more of these possibly more um on the front of it you probably can't see it all but basically on the front it says the operation name so bear in mind every murder every serious crime every serious case will be given what's known as an operation name and that's often just from a generic database that goes alphabetically so it could be operation falcon you know they're often named after birds but it's any any kind of word in the dictionary but it's often a bird or a color or something like that so uh, the operation name the name of the sio lots of personal details on there about the case itself um, and then inside what it is it's a, a duplicate pages where the sio will write their policy what their decision is and then underneath that there's a box for the rationale as to why they did make that decision um, and at the top there are lots of overarching strategies that the sao has to consider that are often relevant to a murder case so there's one here for forensics of course uh, there's one for arrest there's one for family liaison um, we have media searches um, and sensitive issues so policy file isn't often referred to by people but it does exist and, and the sao has to do it if they're really fortunate they might have someone working with them that will that will write the, the policy on their behalf but that's very very um unusual for it to happen in this day and age also they might do it on a computer at the station as opposed to writing it in a book but most of the time when i did it it was often written up by hand and then it forms part of the initial evidential file so bear in mind things like the policy file and the challenges that the sao has to not only make the decisions and make sure everything's being done properly but make sure it's all written down as well at the same time so just checking in with uh, our time see how we're doing um i'm just going to finish with two comments about the tv dramas i've already touched on one anyway that some of the things that are not quite as they would be the first one is the crime scene i've mentioned about the sio or anybody else going into the crime scene and touching things and moving things around the crime scene belongs to the forensic team if they're there or if, if not it's cordoned off waiting for them to arrive nobody else should go in there of course the sio or another nominated individual can go in to that crime scene as long as it's okayed but they've got to be dressed appropriately so that they don't leave any evidence behind or take any evidence away with them um, and the final thing i wanted to mention was around um, police interviews in a police station um, where you see a uniformed officer standing inside the interview room against the wall or outside the door and, and if you see these sort of things and i'm talking about crime fiction tv dramas fiction you'll often see this individual that that's i've never known an officer standing inside an interview room or outside for that matter um, the resources are very limited in any event um, but again i think that's an artistic license but bear it in mind, bear it in mind if you're writing a police interview a situation you're not going to have that officer standing inside or outside if there's a problem in the interview and you need help 
Then there's a strip around the wall normally, which if you manage to touch it, it sets off an alarm and then people will come and help you out, hopefully. Um, but I think it's just the TV side of things that they have this officer there. So keep an eye out for it next time you see one of these dramas because it's not very often that I, I haven't seen them there, to be fair. Um, so we're gonna, I'm going to finish and try open up to some hopefully some questions and then we'll see how that goes in terms of time. And then if there aren't many questions, um, and, and if anybody wants to ask me about something specific, please do so. And if that um, doesn't materialise in terms of times, then I'll I'll just talk about the order of how um, officers and staff will maybe attend the scene of a serious crime, particularly a murder. So if anybody's got any questions on either that you've already got prepared or um, something as a result of what I've said, or you want me to clarify something, um, now would be a good time to do that. Hi Stuart, I have a question. Yeah. Um, so you do this um, consultancy work with authors. So could you just explain a bit about like how that works? Like, would you read the full manuscript or are you asked sort of at the planning stage when an author is thinking about an idea? Sort of what's the usual way that you approach working with an author? Yeah, that, great. Thank you for that question. Uh, yeah, it's, it kind of works in two different ways. It'll be, um, occasionally a writer will contact me and say i've got this idea but i know nothing about how the police work and i don't know whether this is feasible or not can i have a chat with you about it or can i send you what i've got already and can you give me feedback and then i'll decide whether i can do it or not that sometimes happens what happens also is that um, writers will, will get to a certain stage they'll have written something uh, and then they'll just want the clarification around specific issues about police procedure um, and it's often at that point that they'll say, I'm going to send you a list of questions. Or what is becoming a bit more popular now is they'll send me either the whole manuscript to put into context or just sections and chapters that cover the police procedure element um, of the book itself. Um, and then I can go through that, make some notes and then provide, provide feedback with them. So it's kind of flexible, really. Um, what I do find is that I, when I do have conversations, because I do some phone work and work on the internet as well, um, mm -hmm. when I have those conversations with writers, it sometimes kind of sets something off with a writer where they say, oh, I hadn't thought of that. Right. But actually, what about this? Would this work? And it kind of starts a, an engagement there, which, which helps the writer as well. So it can kind of work, work both ways. Um, sometimes I can, I can, by saying something, it starts an idea off in a writer's head and say, well, would, would that work? And well, that's not realistic but if that happened would, would that be so that that's that's a good way of working because it starts very early and then mm -hmm. the writer writes it around that sort of scenario so two two kind of different ways but really anything um even if it's just the odd question you know if, if you're unsure about the name of a, a role or something like that mm -hmm. one thing i didn't mention before so just touch on at the end of this question if that's all right is um if you're writing fictional piece you've got clearly got far more flexibility about what you write because it doesn't necessarily make much difference. But if you are basing it in a real place with a real police force, that's when your research really kicks in. That's when you probably need to know what that department is called and who's in charge of that in terms of rank, because you want to get that information correct. Mm -hmm. So sometimes people often do kind of err on the side of caution and write the, write the fictional version. There's no problem with either. You can, you can kind of mix and match. But the point I make is if you're writing something specific for, say, the Metropolitan Police and you're t telling the name of the unit that investigates murder in the mm -hmm. Metropolitan Police, then that needs to be the right name. And you can find it. It's available. Or you can ask you can ask me and I, I can tell you, you know, the difficulty with um, the police in a way is that if, if, the, if the same department for the same crime was the same throughout the country, it would be great. But they're all different. They've mm -hmm. all got and, and the police are notorious for kind of reinventing the wheel sometimes. So they'll do something, then they'll decide to change it, then they'll go back to what they did initially. So it's always worth doing that little bit of research. And, and if you are going to base it factually on a particular place, if you know, if you can find the name of that unit or the, the rank of the officer or some information about where the police station is, that type of thing, it makes so much difference to just mm -hmm. adding that little bit of that little bit of realism to it, which makes a massive difference. Is there any way that you could sort of 
get into slightly like slightly difficult sort of areas if you're basing it on a real police force that is not a favorable representation um i'd like to think not but it really depends on, on what you've written um right. and, and how you've written it but it's a good point um because you, you, because you, you're basing it on a real place you then fall into the realms of making it as accurate as possible yeah um, and, and one of the things about again i didn't touch on this but please don't forget that if you're if you are basing it in a real place or even if it's fictional have a think about contacting the police for help because mm -hmm. that will that will do two things one it will avoid any issues that you've just mentioned there about misrepresentation or something mm -hmm. that perhaps you shouldn't have written but also they can be really really helpful now i'm not saying if you go to the police station or you ring them up um, if you did ring them up, I would suggest you go, first of all, to the media or the press department as a starting point. Right. But what I will say is, like with any organisation, it depends on the force and it depends on the individual that you speak to initially. So you may get absolutely nowhere and you may get told that they can't help you. But also, I've known writers who've been invited to the police station and been given a guided tour of the custody suite area, the interview area, you know, the, the major crime area. And then they, they couldn't have been more helpful. So don't assume that they won't help you because they might just help you and make contact with them if, if you want to, because that is one way of avoiding the issues we've talked about around the internet and that sort of thing. And what better way to smell, see, feel what a cell is like in a police station than actually experiencing that. And, and I know some writers that have, that have been able to do that. So don't just write it off and think they're not going to help me. There's no point make that call make that visit and just see what happens you may not get the answers you want but it's certainly worth trying yeah that's a very very good point because i haven't thought to sort of actually contact the local police department really um i just kind of assumed i'd be too busy to talk to writers um but i didn't know they had like media department or anything so that's really useful yeah the, the media is it's kind of obviously as it sounds it's for mm -hmm. the breaking stories the newspapers the digital media they manage all those sort of issues um mm. but because of what writers do i think that's probably the best because like you say if you try and ring the station itself you might not get through yeah if you try and ring a non-emergency 101 number you may not get through but what you will do is you'll probably get a, a switchboard somewhere in a call center which will be police related of course but they won't have that kind of personal touch yeah. for the area so that's why i, I wonder whether going to an actual police station if it's open because mm -hmm. they're not all open these days and just asking to speak to somebody from the media department um, or failing that a local a local officer a local police constable or sergeant uh, anybody just just to get that initial point of contact mm -hmm. and it, it is very much a case of the person that you meet first of all in terms of like you say they, they are very busy of course I've already yeah. mentioned how stretched they are resource wise but actually they also do a lot of community engagement as well they do go to meetings the neighborhood team help out with lots of things in the community and th this for me is you know because what better way of knowing that there's a book being written which is kind of based upon their area it may have different names of course it probably will in terms of the officers but i think they would be quite interesting certainly when i was in the police if i'd had any inquiries like this i would have done my utmost to either do things myself or i'd have found somebody to to actually help help people out because that's another another part of, the, of their role albeit they are busy and it yeah. might not go to the top of the list um, mm -hmm. i think the point is it's it's worth trying because if you know it's just some real sort of real nuggets that you could personal nuggets that you could get mm -hmm. from doing that that you you know your might, imagination might be running wild but you might never be able to get those down on paper in the way that you would if you'd experienced and found out a lot of this kind of literally first-hand information yeah, that's really good to know. Um, no questions we... out there. Hopefully everybody can still mm. see and hear me and you've not all gone. Yeah. No, I can still see we've got quite a few people watching this live. So, yeah, if any anybody... questions at all from anybody. Yeah, if you've got any questions, you can pop them in the live chat facility on the on the YouTube page because um, we've got five or so minutes left. So there's still time to answer any questions. Um, 
what I'll do to fill that short gap and, and lesser until something comes up is I'll just talk fairly briefly about kind of one of the most popular things that people write about, either whether it be criminal or psychological thrillers, is, is murder yeah. um, and, the, and the, the scene of the murder and kind of what happens then from the phone call through to the police to the first person arriving. Generally speaking, it, obviously it depends on the time of day and the area and the circumstances um, as to who the first person attending will be. Can you still see me all right, Madeline? Yeah. Because mm -hmm. I've frozen on my screen, but that's fine as long as you can see me. It's usually yeah. going to be a, it's usually going to be a uniformed officer that attends first. It could be a PC, police constable, or it could be a community support officer um, who are neighbourhood officers. It's going to be a uniformed officer um, that's the first to attend the scene of, of a murder. Um, their role is to try and obviously investigate what's gone on as best they can. Um, if there's no suspect there at the time and no information to give an idea of who's responsible, then they have to secure and preserve that immediate area. Obviously, the priority, if there's a person there, is to save life. So if there's any possibility of being able to save that person's life, that's the preservation of life, of course, is the most important. Um, if they're unable to do that for whatever reason, they have to secure and preserve the area. And it will usually by, be by leaving a quite a large space around that area and putting what's known as crime scene tape around there to stop people from going in and making sure that nobody goes in and interferes with that particular scene. Um, other uniformed officers will clearly attend. A supervisor will be involved who will probably be a uniformed sergeant uh, in this day and age, I would imagine. And, and CID would also be informed as well. Um, again, it, of course, it depends on the time of day. If it's in the middle of the night, they're, they're often, there are CID officers and some forces that work during the night. Alternatively, there's always an on-call system where there'll be somebody at the end of a phone, you know, who can, can take a phone call, direct some resources, get some more officers and staff there and start making sure that the investigation progresses correctly. Um, it isn't, of course, all 100 miles an hour. Um, there will be a time when things have to slow down, but as long as the scene is secured and preserved properly, then there will be a point where the, the SIO, the detective in charge of the murder, will be talking to forensics, various other people um, in the area. They'll have a briefing before anything happens in relation to forensic examination. That often happens a little bit further down the line. So to have your forensics in there within the first literally hour or two doesn't usually happen. Very rarely will that happen. It's, it becomes more of a slow time. Obviously, the inquiries to locate the suspect are very fast, but the actual forensic examination is slow and methodical because it's, it has to be very detailed because there could be evidence within that area that's so small that the naked eye certainly can't see it. Um, and that takes time. Sometimes a, a, an examination of a crime scene can take weeks, um, certainly days, and very rarely will it be a matter of hours because there is often so much to do and it has to be done in such a, a slow and methodical way. Um, in terms of the investigation, a team will investigate that murder. Often these days, when I was dealing with the murder cases, it was often from the station where it had happened. So the detectives from that station would be involved in the investigation. Nowadays, most um, of the crime murder crimes are dealt with by regional units. Mm -hmm. So there'll probably be two or three, maybe more forces that will have staff from each of those forces. And they will all form part of a large unit specialising in investigating murder cases. So they'll have their own um, things to do. They'll have CCTV analysts and digital analysts for looking at mobile phones. They'll have forensic staff working with them as well. So it's quite a well-oiled machine in this day and age, um, whereby a group of detectives and police officers and police staff will work together to try and get to the bottom of, of the murder case and hopefully find, find the person responsible. Yeah, that's really interesting. Um, yeah, I can't actually hear you now, so you, you have disappeared, but I can hear you still. Good, uh, that's good. Yeah. I think that went forward to, to move something and, and uh, the, the screen froze, so hopefully everybody else can still see and, and hear me as well. <laughs> um, while I'm talking about the roles of people, I'll just mention the, the forensic pathologist, because the forensic pathologist... Um, 
is the person who will carry out the forensic post-mortem on a murder victim. Um, they sometimes go to the crime scene, but not always. So, you know, if you're writing about a crime scene and you've got your forensic team there, if there's something unusual about the case, um, something unusual, unusual about the way the body is positioned or um, the evidence in the area, it's possible that the forensic pathologist might come to the scene first before they do the post-mortem because it puts it into context for them then and it can make it easier. But they are extremely busy people and they can't go to the scene of every murder. So they have to be fairly selective and it will only be if there's a specific reason why. They certainly don't go to every murder scene, but they will attend murder scenes. Um, and then, of course, within probably 24 hours to 48 hours or thereabouts, they will, the forensic pathologist will be the person that actually carries out the forensic post-mortem. Um, the idea behind that is to try and establish the cause of death mm -hmm. uh, and the manner of death. Sometimes it's obvious, but you may have somebody that's died um, that looks like they may have been stabbed because they've got some injuries that are consistent with puncture wounds. But actually, when the pathologist carries out the post-mortem, it's established that they've been strangled, they've been asphyxiated. So the cause of death isn't necessarily and the, and the stab wound or the puncture wound happened after death so there's all sorts of things like that from a medical point of view that the forensic pathologist will hopefully be able to do when they're doing the post-mortem police officers will also the sio or their deputy will be present at the forensic post-mortem probably another officer will be an exhibits officer because there are samples taken from the body clothing that sort of thing will be handed to the police to log and, and take away with them so that sort of thing happens as well. There'll be a, probably a photographer there taking um, medical photographs as well. Um, and that will normally take place within probably a, a day or two of the actual death. Certainly, hopefully not much longer, but it depends on the availability of the, of the forensic pathologist because they say they are extremely busy. And, and like the SIO, they're on call for a geographical area. So if they're dealing with several murders at once, then obviously they're going to have to prioritise in some way, mm. uh, which is tricky, but that's, that's part of their part of their kind of role. So summing up really about what we've talked about, just to go back through the main areas, I've talked about research and how you can look on the internet, use reference books, look at TV programmes and look at websites. Try and get your characters, the police characters, to be um, not stereotypical if it's set these days. Um, and, and bear in mind the formality, give them backstories and try and make it realistic in terms of the fact that they are going to be quite stretched and they are going to have their own challenges in terms of doing the job that they're doing. Um, and I think if you just bear some of those writing hints and tips in mind, you'll probably be able to produce more, uh, more authentic police procedure. Yeah, definitely. And thank you so much for um, doing this masterclass for us today, Stuart. It's been really informative. And yeah, like the consultancy work that you do with authors sounds really good as well. So I'm definitely going to look into that. Yeah, thanks very much. I'd say if anybody's watching that's, um, that's found it useful, I'd, I'd appreciate any feedback, whether that be through email or, you know, on, on, on Twitter or anything else on GIB Consultancy. Likewise, if you've not been able to get through with questions for whatever reason, or something comes to you later on down the line, then by all means contact me um, through my website would probably be the easiest way of doing it. I'll be more than happy to, to try and help you out. But I hope you found it useful um, and I hope you're all still there. <laughs> yeah, so thank you so much for joining us. Um, next up, we've got a reading from Amanda Deef. And after that, we have an interview with an audiobook narrator so yeah, please do check the YA Thrillicon schedule for the next sessions. <laughs> 